Good morning. Welcome to the gathering of people we call Pasir Panjang Christ Church. Today, many are online. At least eight families have been affected by the latest strain of COVID. And as COVID cases rise again, you will see this pattern. Do not be afraid. Our church is intact. We know exactly where our people are. But blessed are you who can come in person because today our live stream was slightly delayed. <laughs> but now we have live stream, right? And now our people are online. Welcome to our gathering of people called Pase Panjang Christ Church. This week, I thought again about children. You see, my son is 12. And I thought about how difficult it was for a child to understand the concept of wait, of delayed gratification. Even for my son, who is 12, when we were preparing for PSLE, his mind was on enjoyment after PSLE. His plan was, I'm going to Vivo City, my friends, on the last day of my paper, this is what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go. It's difficult for us, as human beings, we prefer to enjoy right now. We want it immediately. In this instant generation, delayed gratification almost, a, almost becomes a bad word. That's the issue that Jesus was addressing in this passage. The text introduces the parable as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable. Why? Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. The context guides us. Jesus is marching towards Jerusalem. This entire section, he's been advancing towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place of kings. Along the way, proximately near Jerusalem, he's been showing all the signs of being the Messiah. The blind can see, the lame can walk. Even the rich, ultra chief tax collector. His life has changed. He starts to give money to the poor, repay the people he cheated four times. The expectation is heightened. As Jesus approaches Jerusalem and the people expect deliverance from Rome. The conception of the Messiah in the Jewish mind was hooray, glory now. The king is here. Jesus, in response, told a parable. It's called the parable of the Minas. And I'm going to show you the slide again. This is the title slide. Our deacon, who designs these slides every week, shows you exactly 10 gold coins, 10 minas. He wants us all to get the full reward. But before we go to reward, it's interesting because there's a historical context to this parable. The parable that Jesus tells, and on that slide, the parable that Jesus tells has a contemporary setting. You see, it's set against a true account. In 4 BC, when Herod the Great died, his son Archelaus was made king of Judea. In order to receive his mandate to rule, Archelaus had to travel to Rome to receive his kingdom. The subjects of Judea, however, hated Archelaus, and they sent a delegation to the Roman emperor requesting that he should not be enthroned. This incident is so well known to everyone, and Jesus uses this incident to create the story to tell the parable. The purpose of telling this story is to explain the delay between his death, resurrection, and ascension till the day he will return. I'll repeat that again. The purpose of the parable is to explain the delay between his death, resurrection, and ascension and the day he will return. The message not glory now, but stewardship. Here's how the parable goes. The main character is the nobleman. He goes to a far place to receive his kingdom, and before he goes, he gives his servants 
instructions. He's a businessman. He makes money. And in that parable, he tells his servants to make money. He gives them resources. Everyone gets one mina each. Now, be careful when you Google mina. Mina means many things, especially in Singapore. But if you Google mina now, in relation to how much it's worth, be very careful because it's a cryptocurrency token as well. And you get the wrong value. Mina, in the time of Jesus, is equivalent to about three months' salary. If you take the median figures in Singapore that are published, you would say between ten to $15,000. Not a lot, but not very little. Enough to do something in business. Well, they're supposed to use the money to make more money because that's the nobleman's business in the story. The interesting thing is that they do it in an environment that is hostile. There are people there that hate this nobleman. They don't want him to be king. So if you imagine popular brands that get whacked in cyberspace and over social media because people want to discredit the branding, the company, the people. Well, the people don't succeed because the king returns. And when the king returns, he asks his servants to report. And number one comes up and he says, your one mina had a thousand percent return. Ten. The second one comes out and says, your one mina had 500% return. Five. And the third guy comes out and says, your mina had 0% return. And the reason he gives was, you are such a hard boss, right? Your standard very high and all. You, you reap what you don't sow, you get what you don't, you know, you don't invest, and you seem to succeed, and you expect that. So I took the safe route. Nah. I just kept it in my handkerchief. Here's the mina. The king replies, lousy excuse. If you are so scared because you know I'm very demanding and you don't want to take risks, if that's what your excuse is, at least put in the bank. Lah. If you put in the bank, I'll get interest, right? What a lousy excuse. I don't want to take risks because your, your expectations are very high. No, no. This guy was lazy. He was just pure lazy. Exposes his heart takes his mina, he gets a scolding, takes his mina, and gives it to the one who has already earned 10 minas. And the guy who owns 10 minas is rewarded with 10 cities. Now this guy is king. He's no longer just a nobleman, businessman. He says he got 10 cities. Guy with 500%, he got five cities. And then he says, you bring those guys that oppose me, they're going to be punished. Remember, Parables are not for one-for-one one correlation of details. Don't, don't go thinking, what is this mina that I have? How come everyone has the same mina? And you know, will I be rewarded for my performance? It's not one-for-one. One. I've guided you on how to read parables. Always check the purpose of the parable and you understand the application for today. Luke helps us. I've already guided you to this point. Jesus was trying to explain there will be a delay. The delay between his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension till the time he returns. Now is not the time for glory. Now is the time for stewardship. In fact, he has a mission for us. As his servants, we should accomplish his mission. What is his mission? Not to make money like the nobleman, that's the story. Jesus has just stated his mission, the verse before. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Nobody reading Luke is going to mistake the mission statement. He's already said it, and approximately he tells you this parable. Faithfully use resources for the king's mission as we wait for his return. 
The truth is that there is deliberate planned delay. The delay is to allow his servants entrusted with resources to carry out his mission. Luke, in the sequel, <clears throat> Acts of the Apostles, shows us how the disciples executed this task. At the same time, the task is complicated by the fact that we live in a world that is sin-sick, that opposes Jesus. Risks that we have to take include relational risks, physical risks, emotional risks. Amidst the opposition, there are risks when we invest resources for the kingdom. We might ask, what are the resources that are entrusted to us in this time in modern Singapore? Let's begin with the spiritual resources that every believer has. We have the gospel, the good news of salvation through Jesus' death and resurrection. We have the entire word of God. The entire canon is left for us. We have God's spirit residing in us, God with us with us until the end of the age, comforting, guiding, enabling. Are we faithfully using all of the blessings and spiritual resources that we have to achieve the King's mission? We heard just now one of our couples talk about reaching their own family with the gospel, having to overcome fear, fear of rejection, fear of relational risks. As we think about this in the reality of our lives, as we think about the people around us, we hear Jesus echo his mission, I came to seek and to save the lost in our relational circles that God has entrusted to us, whether in the family, in school, at work, in the community? Are we actively trying to reach the people that Jesus came to seek and to save? Among our networks, there are people who have yet to come to believe and who will turn, who will be in the number, as our chairman read that bows before the throne in eternity, will we not seek them out? Our job is not to ensure salvation. There is no way we can cause conversion. Responses are out of our accountability. Our job is simply to use the resources faithfully to seek and to save the lost. We realize that when we share the good news of the gospel, people look at our lives, whether we walk the talk. It is very common for people to use a major excuse about the weaknesses of believers so that they will not accept the gospel. Uh, this week, the family members of one of our friends asked me, Pastor, you're telling me about Jesus, but you look at this person, what kind of Christian is he? This one is Christian, eh? We realize then that the mission to seek and save the lost requires, as part of its job scope, personal sanctification. It's not as if you take a loud hailer and go around just yelling out the gospel. It is that you demonstrate it with your life. The rate of return then isn't quite money and isn't quite the number of souls, is it? This is as if Jesus will say, how many, how many, how many did you say? <laughs> That's beyond our accountability. What we are accountable for, first and foremost, is to multiply Christ's likeness in our hearts and lives. Last week, I spoke about the being rather than the doing. The change in our hearts where the Holy Spirit imprints His fruit, love, joy, peace long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. 
in our church, we emphasize personal accountability. COVID teaches us that the most important aspect of life is Oh boy, you've forgotten because COVID is no longer here, is it? <laughs> COVID teaches us that the most important aspect of life is our relationship with God. In our church, we've tried to help this. We have a daily reading through the New Testament challenge that I preach on every Sunday. So you get to read it and get to check if I'm preaching correctly. If that's not enough for you, please do other passages. The daily Bible reading suggests other passages to read. We've asked our small groups to encourage our people to grow in Christ's likeness and apply what we learn. It's not in the knowledge. It's in the application. Our spiritual resources that all of us are given should be faithfully used for the king's mission as we wait for his return. But what about other resources? There are physical resources entrusted to us. Time and energy, skills and talents, financial ability, material resources. Here's what always escapes us. We think we're owners, right? We think we have it, or we've cultivated it, and it belongs to us. And Jesus corrects us. Because in the parable, the servants are servants. They're not owners. Now, they are made owners at the end, but they are not owners now. Are we faithfully using these resources for the king's mission I'm not talking about just in church. We can be serving the Lord to seek and save the lost anywhere in the spheres that God gives to us. Are you in school? Are you in the marketplace? Are you in a particular family, an extended family? This week, one of our members told us, you know, I'm investing a little more with my spouse for the kingdom. I said, praise the Lord. Another of our family members says, for years now, I've encouraged my son to consider ministry above marketplace. I said, praise the Lord. Another of our church members this week, and you know, I think you bless me more than I bless you every time I meet with you. He said, Pastor, I've adjusted my job. I said, why? Just so that I can come to church. If not, I have to work on Sundays. And also, so that I can teach the migrant workers in the Foreign Friends Ministry. I said, wow. Here's someone who's adjusting his physical resources to seek and to save the lost. Brothers and sisters, we are all entrusted with different physical resources. No two people are the same. We have the same spiritual resources, but we do not have the same physical resources. Therefore, we do not stand in judgment of each other. We account to Jesus. The question then is, are we using these physical resources to seek and save the lost. One of our guys is using his skill set. Again this week, he met with me and he shared with me, he's using his business acumen in order to penetrate a particular field and to reach people there as well as to encourage the brethren who are in that sphere. When I heard that, I said, wow! Here, stewardship is not just in there to make the money. It's not just in there to succeed in this marketplace. It's in there, faithfully using his resources for the king's mission. God has blessed our church when I think of our church in physical resources. 
I think of our property. I reflected on COVID this week as COVID numbers rise again. I thought at a time where many churches were empty, our church was full. 100% utilization with a kindergarten and a learning center and hosting missionaries who needed a space to stay, even on weekdays. This 10th of October, or was it 8th? My memory isn't so good now. I'm trying to steal it that better. I did tell you last week that officials from the Ministry of Manpower came to visit us. Part of their visit was to thank us. I received a very nice note after that. I'll just show it to you because the credit belongs to you. All right. Yes. In our community service outreach arm, my designation is Chief Executive Officer. And that is for the purpose of the kingdom. But he was confused, and so he addressed me as Dear CEO, Pastor Joshua, the pleasure is I was in meeting both yourself and Mr. Liu, and that's Brother Anthony, and on hearing how PPCC has intervened when most would have stayed away, especially when COVID-19 was still relatively unknown. A service to our migrant worker and local communities are commendable and inspiring. Thank you once again for PPCC, secular organization, writing in to thank us for our kingdom work. What do we do? I mean, I was thinking about what do we do to deserve this? How did this guy know? Well, and I realized it's on our website. <laughs> and we began with the first lot of 10,000 masks before the government could supply all the workers because they were locked down. They were the first to feel the brunt of COVID. Our first 10,000 residents at Tuas South received their masks. We supplied disinfectants and sanitizers for every single room in the dormitory. Our partners, Red Cross, and people who supplied these disinfectants got in touch with us. They sponsored it. When one block didn't have food, we arranged for vouchers for all of their workers. On May Day, one of our guys who was a previous migrant worker went to bless the community he knew that was his community. We made a video to encourage our people during lockdown. We, our teachers, want to encourage our students. And our resources and our talents were used for this. We quickly ran our free online basic conversation English course so that many who were bored and, and some were fearful, actually. Many became our friends, and our friends became our brothers and sisters. This is just one of the efforts that I reflected on in COVID about how we have used our resources as a church for the King's mission. There are so many other efforts, brothers and sisters. I'm sorry, I just had one because MOM just came, okay? But our anniversary Thanksgiving service in November will focus as we reflect on Psalm 100, as we enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise, as we consider our song in a post-COVID world. COVID still continues, doesn't it, in its cycles. The long tail is still there. But my fear is that post-COVID, we, we go back to business as usual. We forget the King's mission. We use the resources that are entrusted to us carelessly for myself. Will we be that third lazy servant? Is it bird, a bird, a bird, a bird, a bird, a bird, a bird, see me? Sanctification is difficult. It takes effort. Personal sanctification takes Service of others is tiring, especially when we have busy lifestyles. And especially if we think this way, there is nothing in it for me now. There is no immediate gratification. I mean, I cannot see the benefits for me. I'd rather focus all my energies in making money, receiving comfort, 
doing this job, and it demands almost all of me, all of my time and energy, and there's nothing left over that's placed in the direction of the king's mission. Will it be business as usual for you as we venture into a post-COVID world? That would be really sad. There are many ways to get involved in a post-COVID world. Our coffee corner has resumed with so many teams signing up. And if you need to do something which is really of significance to the kingdom, that Jesus himself says, if you pass a cup of cold water to the least of my brethren, your reward will not be missing. Well, we literally allow you to pass a cup of cold water to our people in the coffee corner. See, Sister Mesha. We have ushers that serve us every week. My son reminds me, this is my older son. <laughs> this month he asked me, Dad, what time are you going to church? <laughs> because only on the month he ushers, he says, Dad, what time are you going to church? He has to be on time. We have greeters who help to greet our people and encourage a culture of warmth, not just of performance. We have people now serving our juniors, and you've seen the announcements asking for whoever wants to befriend our juniors or plan games or teach or assist. We have people in the car park downstairs. I was so comforted this morning to see Brother James and to see Brother Wing Kong. But people taking care of the physical aspects of our church, our church administrator, works very hard. People taking care of finances, our chairman and secretary and treasurer, they work so hard they're not full-time. We have people ministering in our youth and young adults' ministry. It's interesting. I want to show you some results of a survey conducted of the state of the church post-COVID. They compared attendances in many churches who participated in the survey pre and post. The interesting comment that they had was there were many young adults who left. In our church, that's a different story. The number for young adults is, I think the age is like 20 to 35. That's what they designed as young adults. And we only count 20 to 30, and we have 103 souls under care, an increase after COVID. And I think to myself, there are people there working hard. I, I think to myself about our social media, our Active Minds program, our Golden Blessings, our Hope Counseling, our missions team, our Get It Right team, people who are equipping us. I give a shout out to the AV team behind. You know, you know the AV team is only known when there are problems. Nobody cares about them. They are unseen. Only when there are problems. Hey, what happened? Well, today, let's do it slightly differently. Can you open the windows and give a big wave? Can please, please open the window and give a big wave? Okay, everybody look at them. Okay, give a big wave. Wave, wave, guys. Wave, wave, I wave. Okay, guys, we appreciate you, and the people say, Amen. Don't just give them the whack. Nah. Here's the comforting truth. Whatever we do for the kingdom, the king remembers. It is the king who is going to reward. The second half of the parable tells us the king will return. He will return and he will exert his authority. He rewards those who faithfully use entrusted resources for his mission. He rebukes those who fail to use entrusted resources for his mission. And he judges those who oppose him. Be careful, brothers and sisters. Don't get mesmerized by the numbers. Wow! Ten minas, ten cities. Five minas, five cities. That must be one for one correlation. If I win ten souls for Christ, I get ten regions. It doesn't work like that. No. Parables aren't meant to be like that. And in case you're wondering why the one mina was taken from the lazy guy and given to the ten, Jesus says it's because those who have more will be given more. Read the intent. Those who are more faithful 
will receive greater reward. Isn't that fair? <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> this is not work salvation. It's simply fair reward. God is perfectly fair. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 to 10, in the words of Paul, yes, we are of good courage. And he's talking about death. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home with the Lord or away right now, we make it our aim to please Him. Why? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done while here in the body, whether good or evil. This is written to believers. This is not written to unbelievers. Paul is speaking about our heavenly dwellings, how we would rather be at home with the Lord, but while we are here, he reminds us how aim is to please our master, our king. Here's a helpful note. Think people, not performance. Once again, think people, not performance. It's not our job to calibrate outcome. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We are not accountable for others' responses. We cannot. We are not able to take the benefit and claim the credit for the salvation of others. We are just to faithfully use resources entrusted to us for the King's mission while we wait for His return. Why? Because we love people. Why does Jesus have this mission to seek and save the lost? Why? Why is His mission that? Why is that his mission statement? Why, when the chief tax collector is so unworthy, why, when the blind man is so devalued in the community, why, when the outcasts of the outcasts, Samaritan lepers, why, when the first are the last, when he goes out to the highways and byways of life, why? Why, when you and I are so unworthy, we are so far from being perfect. It is because the king stops. The king stops for us because he loves us. God is love. Brothers and sisters, if you don't understand this, you don't understand God. The motivation behind seeking and saving the lost is love. He rewards us as we fulfill His mission with His motivation. It is not a performance-driven culture where we think of one, two, three, four, five, six, ten. Then people say, it is when we realize that love is the motivation for the relationships that are entrusted to us. The accountability spheres that God gives to us, whether of our family, of our schools, of our workplaces, of our community, of our church family, of whoever He brings into our life. It is when those relationships reflect the love of God. It is when we reach out with the love of our Savior that people will understand who God is. You and I do not own relationships. I thought about that this week. <clears throat> I told you about my 12-year-old son. I don't own him. He's entrusted to me in stewardship as a parent. And I hope to let go when he reaches, comes of age. But right now, he's after PSLE. And so we're going on a father-son trip. And on this father-son trip this week, two nights, I have bowed on my knees to ask God to give me the skill and ability to communicate and relate well to Him, to be a good example so that we can speak about puberty, personal faith, trust, friendships. 
because I'm trying to use all the resources that God entrusted to me for his mission. Can I be sure that my son will respond? No. But all I need to do is to be faithful, to reach out in love to him, and the rest I can leave to a God who is love. He is the one who came to seek and save the lost. It is Jesus who will accomplish his mission and he entrusts part of that mission to us. What a blessing. This is his plan. It's plan A. It's not a mistake. It's not as if he had to do something and was busy and left us in charge. He has calibrated this delay in order that we, sinners saved by His grace, could faithfully use resources and trust it to us to seek and save the lost. This week, I attended a briefing on the post-pandemic church. <clears throat> Interesting data is that 67% of churches have a decrease in attendees. And this is in the post-pandemic sphere. And of course, during the pandemic, there were much fewer people in church, obviously, for health reasons. Of two-thirds of churches losing people is a lot of churches losing people. Many of them, according to the survey, were large churches who did not or could not provide enough space for their people during the pandemic. The surprising thing that my colleagues and I realize is that we are placed in the category of large church. Our church, I thought, was small or medium. They say, 500 above, you're large. I say, okay. <clears throat> We're about 600 plus, we consider our three congregations. And we've begun analyzing the data and reflecting on this with our staff and our leaders. We want to give thanks humbly, but we also want to review of how we have used our resources during COVID. The reality on a brief interim review is that the philosophy we had was to keep open for all who wanted to come. We made sure there was enough space. In full compliance with the safe management measures, at one point we even split into five services. Mandarin, Hokkien, Saturday, Sunday service for English, and unvaccinated service for our people who are not vaxxed. So if you wanted to come to worship, we gave a signal that we will invest those resources for our people without judgment. Obviously, even now, seven, eight families affected by COVID, they won't be here. They'll be socially responsible. The point is that those who want to come, we will, in love, invest our resources to allow you to come. The motivation is love not numbers. To work hard to provide for our own people. And you remember these scenes. No more already. Lah. That was the cool team taking temperature, doing trace together app. We are no longer cool. Okay, we are very hot. <clears throat> you remember this? <clears throat> In April of 2020, during our circuit breaker, the very first communion. These are the messages and photos that poured in the week after our delivery heroes started to bring the Lord's Supper packages to you, and how far were they willing to go for our church family? I'll tell you that our furthest member lives in the Far East. Far East means Pasirisa for us. In the North Woodlands, in the South Tanjung Baga, in the West Jalan Baha, not the cemetery, Chua Chu Kang, okay? North, South, East, West. I received a message from a brother who was a delivery hero. I went till 1 a.m., me and my wife. I thought to myself, that's love. That is love. Our church administrator told me that week, the first week he tried, 21 condos wouldn't allow our people to go in. I said, how? He said, I will call. I will personally call all the people and meet them, and he went out. We had full delivery, that first community. Praise God for His love demonstrated in and through us. And the point is this. 
God is love. We should love people. We should faithfully use entrusted resources for His mission to seek and to save the lost. Because the kingdom of God advances towards Jesus' return. The King is coming. Jesus is returning to assert His authority. We are in the period of waiting, deliberate waiting for our King's return. We pray as the Lord's Prayer, Your kingdom come. Well, then what do we do before the kingdom comes? Faithfully use entrusted resources for the King's mission while we wait for His return. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, how thankful we are for your loving mission to seek and save the lost. We are not worthy. We are far from it. As we consider the parable that Jesus taught, this time of deliberate delay, plan A, for us to be entrusted resources, spiritual, physical, so that we may use these resources faithfully for the loving mission of our Saviour to seek and save the lost. How thankful we are for your love. We ask for your grace in a post-COVID world. Even as COVID's long tail continues to hit us, not to lose sight that the most important aspect of life is our relationship with you, our God. And as a God of love who comes to seek and save the lost, we affirm in our hearts today in worship of you, in response to your word, as your humble servants, we will personally and corporately do our best to faithfully use the resources entrusted to us for your mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.